could be some bodies or some live people trapped in there. They haven't been, they haven't been able to uh, get the wreckage apart to look. Recapping. Again, live pictures from the site of today's air crash at JFK. Anthony Preisendorf, who was on the scene, mentioned that 12 people that he knew of survived. And I think Frank has some further information on the number of survivors. Frank? Well, the hospitals, Tom, have been standing by as soon as word came out that there was a crash. Emergency units have been functioning. Of course, the sad statistic is that at Mary Immaculate Hospital, Peter McDonald uh, has informed us that uh, they've been told to stand by. They will be acting as the morgue. And they've been told to expect at least at least 107 bodies, which means that they expect that many dead. The Jamaica Hospital has also been standing by. They have received 14 of the victims. Uh, as we pointed out before, 12 were men and two were children. Uh, possibly, we think that two victims may be on their way to Long Island Jewish Hospital. The uh, Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, which is the unit that handles most of the burn cases in the metropolitan area, has been on its way. Uh, we've had no word from them. I, I don't believe that they'll have any patients. Apparently, most of the people in this crash, as Tony has pointed out, uh, were killed. As you may have gathered, News Center 4 has altered its regular format, which is available Monday through Friday on this channel to cover today's events at John F. Kennedy Airport. And the world continues, other matters continue pressing, and we will get on with those in a second. But does anybody here have anything they wish to add before we go ahead with that? No, I don't have anything, Tom. We have nothing. But, oh, we have somebody on the beeper phone, All right. Thomas. All right. We are now going to hear, I, I'm told, from Tony Guida, who is standing by at the hospital He's with a report Jamaica. Uh, at Jamaica Hospital uh, with survivors of the crash. Tony, are you there? It's Tom here in the studio. Yes, Tom. Uh, it's a pretty grisly scene at Jamaica Hospital. There are stretchers lined up on the sidewalk in the street outside the emergency room. They have received here at Jamaica Hospital, they've received 14 survivors from the uh, plane crash, most of them Norwegians, tourists who had been on a trip to the south and the southwest and were heading home for Norway. Uh, one of the survivors who was brought here has moments ago died. Uh, we were able to talk to another fellow from Bergen, Norway. He was in pretty bad shape but lucid, and he told us that uh, it, it seemed that one wing dipped lower than the other as they were as they were coming in for the approach, and the wing hit the ground. He thought uh, the plane crashed. There was an explosion, and after that, he couldn't remember anything else. Uh, he knows that uh, 13 of his colleagues were brought here to the hospital, and he had been suffering uh, terrific burns, uh, hemorrhaging. But uh, I imagine uh, much more fortunate than some of the other people who were on that plane. Tony, have you been able to determine whether any members of the aircraft crew survived? Have not been able to determine that, but we were told here at Jamaica Hospital that the 14 survivors who were brought here were the only survivors. Now, that's not official. That's what the hospital people here believe. Uh, very hectic situation and... Uh, Perhaps it is not accurate, but nonetheless, several officials here at the hospital told us they were under the impression that the 14 survivors brought here were the only survivors from the plane crash. All right. Thank you, Tony. I assume you'll be standing by there, and if anything further develops, we'll be back with you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen? Well, those are the grim statistics. We, we had the numbers pretty close. 107 are practically certain. Uh, that we know of uh, should be taken to that morgue at uh, Mary Immaculate in Queens and the 14 that were brought to where Tony is at Jamaica Hospital. I think it might be helpful to point out here before we get on with the rest of the day's news that what people who are watching this program are seeing is a new story in the making in which information shifts back and forth, numbers of survivors, numbers of casualties, etc. shift back and forth and we really have no terribly hard information here and the confusion of the moment that appears on television is the confusion of the moment at John F Kennedy and also here in our studios Chuck did you want to add yes. that? I, no I was just thinking about what the fellow said we have we have an eyewitness now who was on the aircraft a survivor who talked about that and said the aircraft seemed very low according to Tony and the wing the one wing dipped and hit 
And uh, these accounts are going to be very critical in determining what actually happened, whether it was a gust of wind that tipped the plane over at a crucial moment during the flight, or just exactly what happened. Uh, Tom, we just got this in. Uh, remember, I said before that we had possibly two survivors taken to Long Island Jewish Hospital, Hillside Hospital, and uh, we have their names. Mary Mooney, who is 28, she is a stewardess. You want to know if any of the crew survived. And Robert Hauser, who is 29. So there are two survivors who were taken to Long Island Jewish Hillside Hospital. All right, gentlemen, thank you again. A Boeing 727 Eastern Airlines Flight 66 on the way nonstop from New Orleans to John F. Kennedy Airport here in New York crashed today while attempting to land at JFK Airport. At least 100 people reportedly killed in the air crash. We've been piecing the story together for you here on WNBC-TV, and we'll continue doing that for the balance of our broadcast time this evening. As I noted, there are other things happening in the world today, and it now falls to all of us to switch from the air crash, tragic as it might be at JFK, to other events around the world and here at home, as that trite saying goes. Federal grand juries across the country today indicted 19 individuals and six corporations on charges involving alleged payoffs and other crimes in the recording industry. Three record company presidents were named, among them Clive Davis, the former boss of Columbia Records. The indictments returned today in Philadelphia, New York, Newark, and Los Angeles. Jim Van Sickle reports from Newark. United States Attorney Jonathan Goldstein's news conference in Newark, anti-climax or just the beginning? When the federal investigation into the record industry was kicked off two years ago, it seemed to promise revelations of narcotics traffic, organized crime connections, and a raft of bizarre revelations. The indictments Goldstein announced today were numerous enough, over 160 counts in them, but sensational? The illegal payment to radio station personnel of property, monies, cash, in return for the payment of records, mail fraud, wire fraud, tax evasion, failure to file tax returns, and perjury. Four indictments, 219 pages of them. Payoff, payola to disc jockeys in eight cities, cheating, but hardly the bizarre revelations expected. Among the indicted, Clive Davis, the former president of Columbia Records, ousted two years ago. The grand jury in New York returned indictments charging him with failing to report over a three-year period of time approximately $90,000 in income. Also indicted, the presidents of two other record companies, Kenneth Gamble of Gamble Huff and Nat Tarnapal, president of Brunswick Record Corporation. None of the dope and racketeer revelations so widely expected, but Goldstein says this is just the beginning. At his office and many U.S. grand juries all across the country are working to come up with more and maybe more. Jim Van Sickle, News Center 4. We are covering some of the other developments in the day's news as we await further word on the air crash at Kennedy Airport this afternoon. Our live units, as I'm certain you know by this time, are standing by. In Washington, the Senate Intelligence Committee heard today from an alleged underworld figure, John Roselli. He talked about connections between the mob and the CIA. Roselli, accompanied by two lawyers, slipped by waiting reporters and used the back staircase to enter the hearing room. The 70-year-old reputed gangster reportedly participated in a CIA-sponsored plot to assassinate Cuban Premier Fidel Castro. Also named in the plot was Chicago gangster Sam Giacana, who was murdered last week. Committee Chairman Frank Church told reporters after the three-hour session that Roselli detailed the events and chronology of the plot. It filled us in with much greater detail and a much more complete understanding of the exact nature of the relationship and the chronology. A policewoman told more than 300 New Jersey police chiefs today that female police officers are better qualified to investigate rape crimes. Lieutenant. When people might endanger their lives. And uh, therefore, he was unwilling to make such disclosures. And the committee thought it altogether appropriate to enter into an arrangement of this kind in order that we could have the full detail. Church said the committee has no information about the unsolved murder of Giacana, but Chicago law enforcement officials believe other underworld figures engineered Giacana's death. Church said the committee will extend protection to any witness who needs it. Roy Davis in Washington. Food prices down last week despite a steady increase in the cost of beef and pork. According to the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, the cost of feeding a family of four dropped 25 cents during the past week to $66.22.
However, last year at this time, the same items, the same 38 items, cost only $59.25. Beef and pork prices are expected now to continue their rise until fall, but if the cost of items like fish, cheese, milk, and sugar continue going down, it'll be seen back in the pockets of people where it counts. It was warm here in New York today, so it's not like I'm telling you anything you didn't already know, but what you might not have known is you could have cooled off in the IRT subway. Beginning today, you had a chance, granted a slim one, of getting an air-conditioned subway car. With details, Bill Ryan. Off the hot and humid sidewalks of Lower Manhattan and into the cooling relief of the IRT subway. The cooling relief of the IRT subway? That's right, the IRT today put into service the first air-conditioned trains to run on that line, which dates back to October 27 of 1904. You knew this event was a biggie. There was Mayor Beam and the head of the MTA, David Unish, each of whom has a car with a driver riding the subway. The ride from City Hall to Grand Central was madness in the lead car, with Beam and Unish wedged up against the front door of the train as TV lights fought the air conditioning to at least a draw. At Grand Central, we changed to the flushing line, and as we came up into the daylight in Queens, I talked with Unish and Beam. Uh, this system is 70 years old. This uh, uh, retrofitting uh, uh, design has taken uh, five or six years to uh, finalize, but now we're on our way. We have 20 cars. By next year this time, we'll have 400 cars out of a fleet of 2,300 cars on the IRT uh, system. Mr. Mayor, you're probably tired of money questions, but uh, do you have enough to help him out? Why, yes, we put $15 million into the capital budget this uh, year, which uh, the chairman is going to use for uh, re retrofitting these 400 cars that he spoke about. And uh, we hope that more money will be forthcoming from the federal government that can help us speed the program. The mayor and Unish sample temperatures in the 10-car train as we talked with a representative of the firm which did the installation. The temperature in, in this car right now, according to this thermometer, is 75 degrees. It, the system goes into full cooling at 76 degrees, so that indicates at the moment the system is only operating at half capacity. If the temperature goes up one or two degrees, the system will go into full capacity. After we got to the end of the flushing line at Main Street, the mayor and Unish walked up Roosevelt Avenue for a nosh, corned beef and celery soda. As you might have guessed, the restaurant where the mayor stopped for lunch is air-conditioned, but of course the sidewalk out here is not. And that's the trouble with the trains. You walk on the air-conditioned train, you get hit with a blast of cold air. You get off, you get hit with a blast of hot air. There's only one solution. You have to air-condition the entire city. In Flushing, Bill Ryan, New Center 4. The beautiful weather that ushered in summer this past weekend may have lulled some of us New Yorkers into believing that that was what was waiting in the wings for us for the rest of the summer. Any thought that that was so was diminished as the usual fare of hazy, hot, and humid weather descended upon us today. The first indication of what was in store for us came when we learned that temperatures at daybreak were already in the mid-70s. And as the thermometer climbed throughout the day, New Yorkers mapped out their strategies for coping with the hot weather. For some people, it was a signal to get out into the weather, to lunch outside modestly or extravagantly and the mini parks were filled to capacity. Many chose activities in Central Park, fishing, boating, riding, or just sunning. For other people, the heat was a signal to get in, out of the weather. It was a good day to go to the office, the air-conditioned office, or hunt for bargains in air-conditioned stores. It was also a good day to see a giant shark on the silver screen in an air-conditioned movie theater. And what better time to have lunch with an old friend in an air-conditioned restaurant? And some discriminating travelers even looked for air-conditioned taxis to get in out of the heat. Further encouragement to get in out of the weather came from the National Weather Service, which issued a midday air pollution statement. It said the hot and humid air had caused some marginal air pollution problems, producing measurements in the unhealthy range. The indications are that the sticky, hot, polluted air would be cleared away by afternoon winds and showers and would be replaced by refreshing air from Canada on Wednesday. 
And we can rest assured that we haven't seen the last of the three H's, the hazy, hot, and humid weather that's probably going to become the norm for the rest of the summer. In Central Park, trying to keep cool, this is Norma Quarles, New Center 4. On a warm day in New York, a tragedy at John F. Kennedy Airport this afternoon. Eastern Airlines Flight 66 en route nonstop from New Orleans. The Boeing 727 crashed just short of the runway. Many people killed, at least 100, we are told. And we have just received a report that Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx is now gearing up to treat survivors of the air crash. There are 14 known survivors at this point. And the hospital has asked that we announce that all per diem nurses report to Jacoby Hospital as soon as they possibly can or call 430-5161, that's 430-5161, and only per diem nurses at Jacoby use that number, please. At Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, they're being asked to report for duty as soon as possible. After these announcements, News Center 4, well, we are not going to have the announcements, I'm sorry. We are standing by for a report from Robert Hager of NBC News at the air crash site, and we will go to him as quickly as it is technically possible. We have about 30 seconds uh, standing by for Bob Hager at Kennedy. Again, let me just repeat that per diem nurses at Jacoby Hospital are being asked to call 430-5161 if they cannot report for duty as soon as possible. If they can, they are being asked to proceed directly to the hospital to treat survivors of the air crash at JFK this afternoon. The aircraft uh, apparently crashed at about 4.10 p.m. today. In excess of 100 people were killed, at least 14 known survivors at this point. And now, if we are ready, to Robert Hager of NBC News, who is standing by at The JR. plane went down. Right now, it's a scene of incredible devastation. It's just off the end of the runway at JFK, here on a boulevard. Police rescue vehicles all over the area. A temporary morgue has been set up across the way, and now the grim job of finding and counting the bodies and identifying bodies goes on here. Eyewitnesses here at the scene said the plane, as it was approaching, it seemed to be coming in very low. One man said it uh, hit a, an approach radar uh, light tower. In fact, uh, a pilot reported that he saw four towers had been sheared off. So the plane evidently did hit those towers as it came in. Whether or not that was the cause of the crash is, of course, unknown. Others who were here at the time said it happened during a heavy thunderstorm. There was also lightning in the area. So now, again, the job here is to uh, sort out the wreckage. The wreckage is in a number of pieces. Uh, parts of the plane are not to be identified. The pieces are so small. And then the more. This is Robert Hager, NBC News, at JFK Airport. We cannot converse with Mr. Hager. What you have seen is the first news that most of the rest of the country is getting about today's air crash at Kennedy. That was a part of the NBC Nightly News with John Chancellor, which will appear on this channel at 7 o'clock tonight, but which is fed to the rest of the United States at 6.30 New York City time. Again, in excess of 100 people killed today, 14 known survivors. A number of eyewitness accounts indicate that lightning may have hit the plane, that it was coming in very low on its final approach, that a wing dipped. We've had speculation that possible, possible weather conditions affected the crash, but at the present time, that is all speculation. Now back to the rest of the day's news, which is a hell of a transition. A delicatessen truck uh, filled with coal cuts and coleslaw met a commuter bus in a midtown intersection this morning. The truck fell over on its right side in the middle of Madison at 47th. Fortunately, the bus was almost empty. Only one of its three passengers was hurt, along with both drivers. None of the injuries serious. But if you were among the many motorists in that area at the time, you may have thought the traffic would never recover. The, Del tr the Delhi truck fell on a telephone company truck, but the telephone company employees were not harmed. I really can't get excited about delicatessen truck crashes at this point. We will continue after these announcements. Foster with gray hair. Phil Foster with youth hair. Youth hair cream or youth hair liquid. You rub a little in your hair each day, and in three weeks, you get a dark, natural-looking color without any odor. You see that? I'm never going to look like that again. Not with youth hair. Try it. Great for men and women. What do you got to lose? Just a gray in your hair. Youth hair, now at Rite Aid Drug, Dwayne Reed Drug, Hills Supermarkets, and all drug toiletry and cosmetic counters. Introducing the velvetized vinyl slipcovers by DuraCover Plastics. Yes, 
Velvetized vinyl. This space age vinyl has that velvet feel that's so comfortably soft you'll hardly know it's there. What's more, it's not sticky. We'll cover your sofa for only $39 stock sizes. Call US1-1111. US1-1111. Muta Triangle, terrifying supernatural graveyard for ships and planes or baloney. Read Solving the Bermuda Triangle Mystery in July Reader's Digest on sale now. Seconds, 20 years ago, uh, have a major problem, thyroid cancer. They should check with their doctors. Is this a serious? Stand by. Again, we have our live remote unit set up now at John F. Kennedy Airport, the scene of today's crash. We have another live camera going to the Jacoby Hospital, I believe, where most, if not all, of the survivors have been taken. And while we are waiting pictures from those two locations, uh, we'll talk here for a couple of seconds about health problems with Dr. Frank Field. If you or anybody you know had a series of x-ray treatments for swollen tonsils, for adenoids, thymus gland about 20 years ago, you ought to play, pay close attention to this report by Frank Field. Frank? Well, Tom, it was considered medically safe to shrink swollen tonsils, adenoids, or the thymus gland by means of x-ray treatments in the late 1930s through the early 1960s. But this kind of x-ray radiation was stopped, and now it's being found that patients who received this extensive radiation 20 years ago may be at a high risk of developing thyroid cancer. Now, Dr. Samuel Maydell describes how thyroid abnormalities may be detected. Fortunately, most of them are what we call benign cancers, in that although they really are truly malignant, they uh, spread very slowly. They grow slowly, they, the cure rate is very high with thyroid cancer, with most of them, and uh, we can discover them very easily. See, the thyroid gland is situated just around the windpipe. There's this bump in everyone's uh, neck called the Adam's apple, which is really the thyroid cartilage, and that's the top of the windpipe. The windpipe then extends down below it, and the thyroid sits on both sides of the windpipe, right down here, low in the neck. And so it's superficial, it's very easy to feel. We can find even very small bumps and lumps in it. And if you have a tumor or a cyst or a cancer in the thyroid, we can pick it up very easily. One other thing we can do is we can do a, a thyroid scan. And to do that, we give you uh, a little dose of uh, radioactive material, sometimes called the atomic cocktail, uh, and uh, not enough to have any real effect on your body but enough to, to visualize your thyroid gland. This material is taken up by the thyroid, and if we then put you under a scanner, uh, we can uh, see the thyroid gland. For example, if you want to look up here on this view box, uh, here are two examples of thyroid scans. Uh, this uh, black, all these black dots represent material, a radioactive material that was taken up by the thyroid gland, uh, and the patient was then examined with the scanner, which is sensitive, to this material and creates a photographic image of the dots. Here's another one, where as you can see, the uptake was not as uniform as it was here, where there are areas where that aren't quite as black, where there's small gray dots and even areas where there are no dots. Now these would represent small cysts in the thyroid gland in this patient, and if you had one or more of these, uh, we could uh, detect it by this method. But most of the time, we can pick it up by simple physical examination alone, so it's very easy to examine the thyroid is very easy to detect. Anyone who has a child received an extensive series of x-ray treatments for a condition around the head, neck, or chest uh, should have this type of examination. Now, not, uh, I want to stress, not children who've had x-ray examinations of the head or chest or neck, but children who've had a series of treatments for uh, any benign condition, such as enlarged tonsils or adenoids or enlargement of the thymus gland this type of treatment uh, in the uh, late 1930s up to the early 1960s was a fashionable type of treatment and thought to be a good type of treatment for that condition. It is very important that all individuals who received extensive x-ray treatments during infancy or adolescence should mention these treatments to their family physician at their next checkup. This is not an emergency, but the next checkup they should mention this. Or call the hospital or the doctor where such treatments were given or call your local medical society for the name of a doctor who can do a checkup on the thyroid. 
Now, the New York State Medical Society is aware of all this, and it is preparing the pamphlet with more information on the subject. And if you're interested, why, please drop me a line here at NBC. Do not call me. Drop me a line, and I'll send you the pamphlet. Tom? All right, thank you, Frank. And let's get back to that tomorrow night or some less busy day, this whole matter of x-rays and the possible after effects. I am told now we've had a number of calls from John F. Kennedy Airport. And I suppose that this is going to sound the cub, but life goes on. And I am told that the airport is operating normally. That is what I am told, that flights are arriving as scheduled, that if you have somebody coming in, you can go out to the airport and the plane will be there and you can meet them. Or if you are leaving New York tonight on board any of the scheduled commercial airlines, they are operating and your plane will leave as close to schedule as possible. That is what I am told here. It may change between now and 10 o'clock, but for the moment, the airport reportedly is operating normally. We will continue from JFK, from Jacoby Hospital, and from Rockefeller Center after these announcements. Shell Information Series, 1975 cars. If your 75 car is in tune, but still runs on, or knocks, you could be using a low-octane gasoline. Your engine might need one of the higher-octane unleaded. For example, Shell Super Regular Unleaded. It's higher octane bites engine knock and run on. It's also blended to help correct hesitation and cold engine stall outs. Drive only when you have to and choose a gas plane that's right for your car. The Wiz winner of seven Tony Awards, including Best Musical. He's on down, he's on down the road. He's on down, he's on down the road. down to the Majestic Theater and see Broadway's new hit musical version of the wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Wiz is a wow! Oh, you can't get by if you're on the fly with a gulp or two from a cup. Cause your energy pool needs that morning fuel, so eat breakfast, don't pass it up. Whether kid or grown up, you better own up to one big important fact. After you've been sleeping, your body's just creeping without breakfast in your act. So eat breakfast, don't pass it up. Presented in the interest of good nutrition by Kellogg's. United States Funny Car Championship. 200 mile an hour funny cars. Friday and Saturday night, Sunday afternoon at National Speedway. We have altered our format here to cover today's air crash at John F. Kennedy Airport, and many of the eyewitness accounts, or I shouldn't say many, one eyewitness account, has it that lightning apparently struck the tail section of the 727 as it was on final approach. We have had some speculation, and I caution it is only speculation as to the possible effect of that lightning on the aircraft, and Chuck Scarborough is still here, and we'll speak more about that. Chuck? Yes, we were discussing it earlier, and we said we didn't see how that the lightning could affect control surfaces on the aircraft or whatever have you enough to cause a crash. Normally, it travels through the skin. Uh, Mr. John Beerchuk called us. He says he's with Grumman, and he's done a paper on the effects of lightning striking aircraft. And it hasn't been a problem until recently, until they've gone to more sophisticated flight control systems where you have computers that uh, actually synthesize the information necessary to make an, an instrument approach and put it on one big display there, you see. So the pilot is watching a computer, really a computer readout, mechanically done, while he's flying down on instrument approaches. Uh, Beerchuk says that it is possible for lightning when striking an aircraft to knock out the computer. If so, this instrument, the primary uh, landing instrument he's using at the time, would, uh, would go haywire. And if, uh, when he's that low, and as we saw in the picture, he was lined up with the runway. You saw the approach lights mm -hmm. to the runway, mm -hmm. the little flashing strobes. So he was right on target there. If at that last moment something happened to cause his flight director to go haywire, uh, just a split second would all be all and take. Again, I think that because of the intense thunderstorm and lightning activity, many of us may be trying to associate the weather conditions with the aircraft conditions, and only, as you have said, a check of the flight recorder and complete investigation by NTSB would sure. give the final clue as to what caused the crash today. Frank mentioned in our report that we had 14 known survivors, that one of them, Mary Ellen Mooney, a stewardess, survived the crash? That's right. There were, uh, well, there were two survivors that were taken to Long Island Jewish Hillside Hospital. Mary Mooney, who is 28, she's a stewardess, and a Robert Hauser, who is 29. There were 14 taken to Jamaica Hospital, where one died, Tony Guida tells us. Uh, most of the uh, survivors there uh, were men. 
Uh, there were 12 men and two children, but one died on arrival there. Eastern Airlines has now released the uh, names of the members of the crew on board the aircraft. The captain is identified as John Clavin, first officer William S. Eberhardt, second officer G. M. Gearin, and cabin attendants Maureen Davis, Robert Hepler, Mary Ellen Mooney, and Jackie Lindsay. Uh, this is a New York-based crew for Eastern Airlines. We have heard one man say this afternoon on this air, and I'm certain that others have said it, that they would never fly again, and I think this might be an appropriate point to introduce some conversation about the safety record of the commercial airlines in the United States of America, companies which go through moments of terrible anguish when something like this happens, uh, men and women who work in public relations departments the year round and help old ladies on board of airplanes and make sure that everybody's dinner is warm at moments like this are asked to perform duties which are above and beyond the rationale of any human being. They are going through great anguish tonight. But I hope that we have not presented too much talk that would tend to destroy the confidence of our viewers in the safety records and the technical capabilities of the American air transportation industry. Gentlemen. That's true, and uh, the fact that uh, Chuck points out the question of lightning has been brought in, you said it was a supposition, speculation. Uh, weather reporting, too, is a problem here because a weather observer shortly before the incident occurred was reporting TRW minus, that's a light thunder shower, not a severe one, but that was at one part of the airport. Since the airport is several miles in length, it could very well have been that at the other end of the airport, unknown to the weather people, that there was some severe turbulence and severe thunderstorm activity. So uh, again, here too, weather is speculation, and again, we must await the fact. One other element that we talked about a moment ago was that uh, we had an eyewitness on the scene who said that several of the, uh, uh, light fl the approach lights were, were clipped. Not the off, yeah. Uh, it could well have been that the flash that the eyewitness saw, the police officer, the flash he saw that he assumed was lightning hitting the plane could have been a flash caused by the plane striking one of those towers with the... Uh, with the strobes on it. So there, there are more questions, obviously, than answers right now, Tom, and it's, uh, as you said, and we've said many times, it's going to take a thorough investigation here. There is one other element in this uh, about the, the survivor uh, who is a flight attendant. I think we have two of the survivors who are flight attendants. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two seats in the rear of the airplane. They're called jump seats in the 727s, and they are the only seats in the aircraft, aside from the, the flight crew on the flight deck up front, that have shoulder straps. And uh, I am making a presumption, but I would assume that these two seats with these two uh, passengers in them who were the flight attendants uh, probably contributed to their survival. All right, we have our remote unit standing by at John F. Kennedy Airport, and the reason that we have not gone back there is there is simply nothing new to report at the present time. Uh, the airplane crashed at about 4.09 this afternoon, in excess of 100 people killed, Eastern Airlines Flight 66. Our other remote unit is being set up as we speak at Jacoby Hospital, and I'm told that we will be able to go there in about a minute and 45 seconds, and we will be back in that stretch of time. You can do beautiful things with Schweppes tonic water, bitter lemon, club soda, and ginger ale. Everything Schweppes touches it improves with the sparkle of Schweppes and the curiously refreshing quality you get only from Schweppes. And let everything else be ordinary, the taste of Schweppes makes it extraordinary. Schweppes, the taste maker. Come to Mama Leone's where the Paul Newman drowning pool. I spotted your car. You spotted my car. Would it wash off? Harper days are funny days. Mystery days and shootout days. Sexy days and action days. Days more fun than you remember when. Harper days are here again. Paul Newman is Harper in the drowning pool. Rated Starring Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward starting tomorrow. I am in error when I say that our remote is going to be set up at Jacoby Hospital. It is going to be at Jamaica, but Frank advises me that the two will both be coordinating their efforts in the treatment of the survivors of the air crash today. We have confirmation now that two members of the Eastern Cabin crew did survive, Mary Ellen Mooney, a stewardess, and Robert Heffler, a steward, both members of the Eastern crew based here in New York. While we are waiting for our remote facilities to become available, here are some other things that happened today. 
There was a time when nearly every American carried the name Ivy Baker Priest in his or her wallet or pocketbook because she was the treasurer of the United States during the Eisenhower years, and as such, she had her signature on every single piece of paper money printed by the United States government and on every single piece of counterfeit money printed by some counterfeiters. After serving for eight years in Washington, she went back to California. She served two terms there as treasurer of the state. Mrs. Priest died of cancer last night in Santa Monica at the age of 69. She once said that she was qualified to be the treasurer of the United States because she came from a background of poverty, and she liked to tell friends that it was a safe bet that she handled more money than any single man or woman, woman in the history of the United States. If your sex life and your tax life are related, then Uncle Sam thinks he is justified in keeping tabs on your sex life. Internal Revenue officials made that point today at a House committee hearing on IRS snooping. Here is a report. It wasn't a good day for the IRS. A report that they released to other agencies, but not to the subcommittee, appeared in this morning's newspaper. And Chairman Benjamin Rosenthal was not amused. I think you're a candidate for contempt of Congress. And the committee will consider that at the conclusion of the hearings. Operation Leprechaun, run by Agent John Harrison in the Miami office of IRS, resulted in files being established by confidential informants that investigated the sex lives, drinking habits, and hang-ups of a number of important people in Miami, including the state's attorney. A newspaper broke the story. Assistant IRS Commissioner Warren Bates commented. There, there was some evidence, or evidence that he gathered information on the social activities, sex lives of individuals, why he did that, this, uh, uh, that were not in any way related to tax. Uh, to, to the administration of taxes. Why he did this, I don't know. You'd have to ask Mr. Harris. His answer was that he felt that everything he gathered was tax-related when we interrogated him. According to IRS Commissioner Donald Alexander, the investigation was to determine tax dodgers and criminals. The premise being that if you set up a mistress in an expensive apartment, you might be a tax dodger. But, said Alexander, the new commissioner, that's all over now. Bill Elward on Capitol Hill. Today, one of the worst aircraft disasters in the history of New York aviation. Anthony Preisendorf standing by at the crash site just off the runways of JFK. Here is Anthony Preisendorf. If things could get any grimmer here at the accident scene, they have. It has begun to rain, which makes the work of the rescuers and the people trying to put together the pieces of human life and wreckage of the aircraft together even more difficult. Still, a lot is not known about this. What we do know is that the plane was coming in for a rather routine landing, and an off-duty Nassau County policeman, Paul Moran, says he saw lightning strike the tail section of the plane as it was approaching the runway. The plane veered to the right and uh, broke into flames and just scattered its pieces, luggage, and bodies over a two-acre site. Also knocked down one of the uh, landing lights. The reports are conflicting at this point. Some say there are two or three survivors. Some say there may be as many as a dozen. One of the first policemen on the scene says that he was able to pull two people out of the wreckage. He identified both of them as crew, one male steward and one stewardess. Underneath every one of those white sheets, a body or a piece of a body, this, this survival work, grim work of picking through the pieces of lives and people, We'll go on into the night, and we will be here to bring you the reports of what happened as fast as we have them. At JFK, Anthony Preisendorf, News Center 4. All right, thank you, Tony. The worst aircraft disaster in New York City history was a collision, of course, of the United Airlines DC-8 jet and a TWA super constellation. They collided over the city. 134 people were killed at that time, including six on the ground. That took place during December of 1960. In March of 1962, an American Airlines 707 jet crashed on takeoff. 95 people died. And then in February of 1965, an Eastern Airlines DC-7B crashed into the Atlantic after takeoff. 84 people killed there. In excess of 100 people killed today. In the crash of the Boeing 727 Eastern Flight 66 nonstop New Orleans to John F. Kennedy. We will join John Chancellor for the NBC Nightly News at 7 o'clock, and then most of us, or some of us, or all of us, will be back with a special report live on the 
air disaster today here on Channel 4 at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, again, the airport is operating as normally as possible, considering the conditions. If you are leaving the city tonight, I am told that all commercial flights are operating as close to schedule as possible, and they are arriving the same way. Uh, needless to say, people are being asked to stay away from the crash site because they have more people there than they need. What you have been watching here is television in the raw, a new story in the making. Much of what has been said here and elsewhere is wrong information only because we know nothing truer at the time. And that will be left to, to some future determination by those people who will be assigned to investigate the air crash at JFK today. For all of us who work at News Center 4 at JFK and our hardworking tech crews, thank you for watching and until 7.30, good evening everybody. WNBC-TV, Channel 4, New York. I'm Henry Marcotte, and this is a WNBC-TV editorial. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, which banned literacy tests and placed local election boards under the jurisdiction of the Federal Department of Justice. This permitted millions of black voters in the South to exercise their franchise to vote. Congressman Peter Rodino calls it the most effective civil rights legislation ever passed. The Voting Rights Act will expire in August. An extension of the act has been passed overwhelmingly in the House of Representatives. The measure is sponsored by Congressman Rodino and Herman Bedillo, and it would extend the act another 10 years and expand it to citizens of Spanish heritage, American Indians, Asian Americans, and Alaskan Natives. Three counties in New York, Kings, New York, and the Bronx, and three towns in Connecticut would be affected by the extension. These areas with a high concentration of minority language groups and a high rate of illiteracy will receive special Justice Department attention during all elections. Although the act cleared the House by a vote of 341 to 70, it is faced with attempts to weaken it in the Senate, and there are some fears it may be kept in committee after the 4th of July recess, and the present act will expire without extension in August. This cannot be allowed to happen. We suggest you write your U.S. Senators and the Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, James Eastland, and urge them to work for passage of S-1279 the Voting Rights Extension Act. This has been a WNBC-TV editorial. I'm Henry Marcotte. Sum up 25 years of global NBC News coverage in two words, John Chancellor. Translate 45 overseas assignments into each fast-breaking report, John Chancellor. For the news you must have, total information nightly. John Chancellor on NBC Nightly News.